Chairman, sir, distinguished members of the audience, I know that uh, the chairman has given you a mouthful already, right? In fact, I should have taken the cautionary step of warning him that uh, somehow I don't know from where uh, this bio data of mine somehow seems to flow out, and that takes the better part of the lecture. It's not really necessary. The more important aspect of the bio data, actually, to me, for the for the audience to know, is. Uh, what is my experience on the subject which I'm going to speak about? Well, let me tell you, uh, wherever in India you have had a problem of turbulence in terms of terror, and we have been involved in counter-terror, I have been there. Starting from uh, the experience in Punjab, extensive experience in Punjab, a long experience in Sri Lanka with the Indian peacekeeping force, in Nagaland, in the Northeast, and uh, very, very extensively in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, where uh, at every rank I happen to serve, from a second lieutenant to a lieutenant general. And it is with that experience that I speak here today. This may be a structured talk, but it is not something which uh, you're not aware of. You are aware of everything I'm going to speak about. In such talks, what you should be cautious about is that these are reminders to you. Human beings have very frail minds. There's so much of data of the world which we take in every day that we tend to relegate lots of important things. And that's why such events come. It is these events which remind us that there are issues to be looked at which we may have forgotten once in a while, here and there. That is the only import of such a talk. But I thank the Bangladesh Institute of Strategic Studies, General Rahman, the Chairman, my good friend, the DA, Brigadier Nanda here, who happened to be one of my staff officers in Kashmir, one of my most important staff officers in Kashmir also. I thank you for giving me this honor because I can see that this is a center of excellence. And to get access to the podium here and speak is an amazing honor. And to have the PSO of the AFD, General Islam, coming here personally and leaving his work, all the important work, and attending personally here is an even greater honor. Thank you very much for that, sir. Having said that, I hope uh, we can now. Ah, OK. Can you see clearly at the back? Or no? I can. Can you hear me clearly at the back? No problem in hearing me? OK, OK, OK. This has to start with a few assumptions. A little orientation for my audience, a little bit of an apology for the shortcomings of the presentation. Primarily the shortcomings, this is an Indian bias. This is a view with an Indian bias. Keep that in mind. From an Indian mind. An Indian military mind, an Indian military mind can sometimes be very different to an Indian mind. It's a very brief attempt to analyze internal turbulence of individual nations. That's not my intent to go into individual nations of South Asia. But uh, I will reflect very, very briefly upon individual nations too. It covers common narratives, transnational links, proxy war issues. I am not making any attempt to define terror, militancy, or insurgency at all. I hope you can see, sir, because you are being covered. I hope uh, the cameras can move out to the side slightly. The chairman cannot see otherwise the slides. Oh, okay. No attempt is being made to define this because if I go into the definitions of terror, insurgency, and militancy, uh, this lecture will it'll take up the whole lecture itself. Uh, I will go by a common understanding that this is subnational oriented. I think this light needs to be put on. I'm aware that I'm addressing a very, very refined and a very intellectual audience, which itself is a rarity. You don't get to easily get together an audience of military people and diplomatic people from the diplomatic community, intellectuals, media. You don't get administrators, 
you do not get such people to come together to listen to a person from a third country. And that, that's where I'm really honored. The environment which facilitates terror. This is something which we should be all aware of. Can we have these lights off? Because I don't think the audience can see this too well. OK, 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 OK. I, I will keep reading out where the things can't be read easily. Remember the environment which facilitates terrorism. And the, starts with this aspect. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. No better place to exemplify this than the state of Jammu and Kashmir, where we have been fighting incidency, militancy, terrorism for the better part of the last 25 years. And from the other side in Pakistan, they say, no, this is a homegrown incidency. This is, a, you know, um, uh, all been instigated within India itself. We say it's a proxy war. They say we only give support. So this in and out the problem always continues. The other aspects which you need to know very briefly, I'll recall, are you need a subnational or a minority alienation. And this word alienation is most important in this. Because if you look at all aspects of terror, it always starts from alienation. In some form or the other, societal alienation, religious alienation, subnational alienation, minority alienation, anything. The moment a community of people, starting from an individual to a community, a set of people start feeling alienated, that's the start point. All they need after that is leadership, they need triggers, they need an ideology to build up into it, and it becomes a full-blown terror movement. Then faith, extremism, extremist ideology, ignorance. And ignorance obviously means lack of education. The moment you have a society in which ignorance is there, in which investigation is not encouraged, you will always find a vulnerable society. So lack of education, lack of employment opportunities, social structures, this is the given understanding in definitions of all aspects of militancy, terrorism, and, and uh, incidents. The moment you have this kind of deprivation, Deprivation leads to alienation. Alienation leads with triggers to terror. And then you have weak integration. You may have a community of people, which is why I yesterday also I was speaking. Uh, I was saying, what is the strength of Bangladesh? And since a large part of my audience comes from Bangladesh, let me say, what is the strength of Bangladesh? One of the greatest strengths of your nation is the fact that you don't require integration. You are a nation. This is where you need perhaps someone from outside to come and make you realize this and tell you this, that you are a nation which is already integrated. You are a nation with a syncretic culture. You are a nation with a very rich culture of fine arts, literature, music, everything put together. And one ethnicity, one language. Where can you get a, language, a country in the world, a nation in the world with such advantage? This is, a, this is an important aspect to keep in mind about your own nation. Then you go back to proxy war, border interests, the aspect of uh, cross-border interests, proxy wars and proxy, proxy cross-border interests of one nation in the other nation. Typical case of the India-Pakistan equation. A vulnerable diaspora in an alien environment. What do I mean by this? Typically. A very large segment of South Asia, including from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, resides in a third world countries, in other countries. A very large segment of it lives in the Gulf countries. No controls. Our governments have no controls on them. Many of them are from lower strata of society. Many of them go there to eke out a living and send home money. Mostly, where do they live? in rundown labor camps, rundown conditions, particularly you can see at the moment with the upcoming World Cup in uh, the state of Qatar, where you're having a huge number of stadiums being built. Who's building these stadiums? Very largely the labor is from South Asia. Where do they live? In rundown conditions. These are the people who are most vulnerable. The people who are most vulnerable to radical ideology. Because they already deprived people to an extent. They are not aware people. They are not netted to the world. They don't have, they don't Google around every day. They cannot investigate. They, they don't have a sense of rationalism. 
and therefore fed a diet of ideology, this is a very vulnerable segment of society. This is the same segment of society which returns to our countries here. And it's around the, them that you will find capsules building up. Then you have uh, what you may not be able to easily read, safe havens, drugs, and illicit arms trade. Transnational. This is an, an area where you have this kind of linkages on drugs, narcotics, illegal arms trade. You will find that that's an area hugely vulnerable <laughs> to all aspects of terrorism. <coughs> Cast your mind back. What was happening in Sri Lanka? Where did the LTT, and I, we've got the Sri Lankan ambassador sitting with us, where did the LTT get all his arms? An island nation. How do arms flow into an island nation? And then you realize what huge networks existed all over Southeast Asia. There were conduits from all directions which used to enter into northern Sri Lanka and eastern Sri Lanka at that time. And the Sri Lankan Navy, of course, was adept at preventing this to a great extent, but could not, could not stop it a whole scale. And that's how this thing continued. Money, financial conduits. Where did the money come from? I went to Canada, I remember. I will speak on Sri Lanka a little later. I went to Canada, and in the morning papers in Montreal, I saw a, a huge entertainment program being set up there by the Tamil community. And there I found, from people when I spoke to, I found that money was being raised all over the West for the fight in northern and eastern Sri Lanka. So it's financial conduits which keep working on this. The last part is that itself, counterfeit and other financial conduits. The moment you have money available, you may have ideology, you may have leadership, you may have everything available with you. You may have a cause, you may have alienation, but if you don't have money, Nothing can run. Imagine, why is the Islamic State today a successful terrorist organization? Because the day they, the campaign started, on the first day in Mosul, they went and raided the treasury. $489 million were looted from the treasury. They, that made them the richest terrorist organization in the world. The Al-Qaeda could not even match them. And secondly, the Mosul refinery itself was producing oil. And unfortunately for the Islamic State, that oil prices have crashed to $45 a barrel or whatever. And they were earlier selling it at 50% of the rate. So even if they're selling at $30 a barrel today, they're still making a packet. But it's a very interesting thing to also see who was buying that oil. After all, the whole world was condemning the Islamic State. And the question should come to us that if their finances are coming out from the refinery in Mosul, someone has to buy their oil. And when you investigate deeper, you find that all the people who are fighting them are buying their oil. I'm not going to name the nations, but those nations who are fighting them are all buying their oil. So this is a strange paradox, a strange thing which happens whenever you are in, involved in terrorism and counterterrorism. Okay, some uh, regional commonalities. I know it's going to cause a little problem for you, but this is small, but doesn't matter, I will keep pointing out. Some regional commonalities in South Asia. A colonial background, some deficiencies of the colonial period, which continue to fester. Territorial problems. The problem between India and Pakistan is essentially a colonial problem. Kashmir remained a colonial legacy and over the last 70 years, we've not been able to resolve that. That is a nation-to-nation -nation problem which has led to issues of proxy war and proxy terrorism. You have trans-border ethnicity, which creates problems. Classic case is the case of Sri Lanka, northern Sri Lanka, with the Tamil minority, and the Tamil population in southern India. So you have an affinity. Where did the Tamil population in Sri Lanka come from? It came from primarily the labor which the British took to tend to the various tea gardens, particularly in Sri Lanka. Left them behind there, and that's how you find now a diaspora virtually of Tamils in Sri Lanka. And half of Sri Lanka's problems come out from this, and the linkages between the community, Tamil community in northern Sri Lanka and eastern Sri Lanka with the Tamil community in India. 
And then you have overpopulation. Of course, there's a commonality between our overpopulation in most of our cities, underdevelopment, economic disparity, and deprivation, which is the common narrative anywhere in the world. Almost anywhere in the third world, you will find these conditions. It's not that 100% of the places where you have such conditions, you will have terror. It's not necessary. The important aspect is that you have to have a cause, you have to have ideology, you have to have the financial conduits, the wherewithal, and the most important thing, the leadership. And you found leaderships can change everything. What happened in the case of the Al-Qaeda? Osama bin Laden, iconic leader, that terrorist leader, he took, uh, took Al-Qaeda from one level to the highest levels. Today, what's happening to, with Baghdadi? Baghdadi is an iconic figure within the Islamic State today. Same with Prabhakaran in the state in, in, in Sri Lanka. Became an iconic figure. In fact, I would say, if I was asked to identify the center of gravity of the problem in Sri Lanka at that time, the center of gravity was Prabhakaran. The moment Prabhakaran got